Sorry, that's me. <laughs> ah, there you go. I was going to say that's a funny voice for Zoom. <laughs> I've heard this before. <laughs> yeah. I, I miss uh, the days when it didn't tell us that it was being recorded. Yeah. There must have been an, you know, a lawsuit or something about that. You didn't tell no. me you were recording. No, it's just modern times. <laughs> yeah. Um, New York State, you can actually record anyone as long as someone within the group that's being recorded knows they're being recorded. It doesn't matter if everyone else does. Really? Yeah. Really? Which I don't really understand, but that's that's the law. Um, anyway, uh, we are back for the Hamlet working group. And um, this week, what I want to- Select attendance. <laughs> we have relatively light attendance. You know, we're changed up the day at people's request. And this is where uh, it got us. I will say Thursday this week snuck up on me a bit being earlier than Friday and a short week. Um, yes. So, you know, people did get the reminder, but uh, it is still, still is early and, um, and a, a short week. So I wouldn't be surprised if other people were caught by that the way that I will admit that I was. Um, I thought this week, uh, I mentioned in the email that we would look at a survey. So Pat asked, um, and I hoped we would have discussed last time, um, but we didn't yeah. get to it, um, a survey that Pat can take around to um, Hamlet residents. Um, and I, I thought I would share that with the group and also um, you know, get some, some thoughts about what things would be useful to ask people um, and uh, let me put it on the screen. So I just had a chance to kind of get a, get a start at it, at some questions. And I definitely think there's more that we can do, um, but I also want to keep it reasonable. And um, uh, the other thing that I, I wanted to say is Pat and I discussed um, that I think it's important that we keep questions like this based on um, things that uh, people can give us good and useful answers about and that we're gonna do something with. And one of the things I thought might be useful is some questions about values. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, basically the, I, I put together a bunch of stuff, a list of things that we could have people kind of rank or scale or something like that. Um, but the way SurveyMonkey works, it, it wanted to charge me money to save that copy of the survey. So I removed it and saved a copy of basic questions. And we can talk more about whether or not those other things are worthwhile. Um, I, I, I'd like to ask, um, do you think that it having one or even a small number of people personally contacting the survey, um, whatever they're called, people being surveyed, might not introduce uh, some form of um, bias. I, I don't think so. Um, it, uh, is, it is a well-known phenomenon under, under conditions like that. Well, maybe you should wait and see what questions we're talking about. And, and well, you, you said values. <laughs> that, that, tr that triggered that thought. Yeah. Well, Ted, for example, I um, encourage the rows to complete the survey and attend the meetings and Kevin and um, Gladys, Lacey Verona, I encourage them to do the survey. And I mean, it's it's just anybody particularly, you know, along that I know along 96B. So I, I don't think that would skew the well, survey. What I, what I heard David say was that someone would actually take the survey to them and fill it out. And that- We're Not fill it out, but, but hand it to them. <laughs> Or drop yeah. it off. Yeah. Right, and that that that's a typical problem in po in in survey and polling that you want to do it, uh, shall we say, as identically to all as possible, with, and without introducing bias. Well, having one person do it to everybody certainly would be minimizing the person-to-person -person variability. That's true. In, that's in true. Delivery. But it would be it would be maximizing the possible bias in one direction. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, potentially, I guess, depending on, you know, how much a person delivering a survey can bias the answers. <laughs> Not a whole lot if you're doing it. <laughs> There's no time to screw around if you want to get through everybody. <laughs> Anyway, let's take a look at the questions. That's and see exactly whether or not yeah, let's point. look at the questions, right? That was wasting time. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what they so, what have in mind. So the, the questions here are kind of more about getting people involved and less about, do you think the setback should be 15 feet or 20 feet? Uh -huh, right. That's not really very useful feedback, um, particularly from people who aren't, don't have expertise in what that means and haven't been involved in the process. So. First question is, where do you live? And the choice is Central Danby, Hamlet, West Danby, Hamlet, in Danby, but not in a Hamlet and outside of Danby. So Pat has volunteered to take this to everyone in the Central Danby Hamlet. I yeah. would like to make it available online or through anyone else who would like to take it um, to other residents in the town. I, I think there's some utility there. So we're, we're expecting people to self-identify as being in or not a uh, Hamlet. Yep. And I, I do know that that's problematic because there is no definition of any of the Hamlets. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> in fact, I just had someone in, I mean, people don't even know what the town boundaries are, much less there's right. no such thing as a Hamlet boundary. Yeah. Um, I had someone in the office this week actually asking me where the town of West Danby is, um, and I had. Well, to, they're not the only ones that have said uh, that yeah, of yeah. West Danby. Oh, you mean we're yeah. not a town? <laughs> no. <laughs> or a village? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I do have a question because we have um, the the new map has two hamlets: the Central Hamlet and the Hamlet neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. What is this intended to be? You know, who, are you, who are you delivering it to? Is that, is that the question? No, no, no. Do, with the Central Danby Hamlet, does that just mean the Central Danby Hamlet? Or does that mean the Hamlet does neighborhood? Mean, does that mean the core, you mean? Yeah, yeah I want so to that, know whether it's a, the Central Hamlet or the uh, neighborhood Hamlet. Is that both together for, okay. Okay. for, for each? For West okay. Danby, in West Danby, there's a core and a neighborhood. And in Central okay. Danby, there's a core and a neighborhood. OK. Both of which are part of our um, Hamlet, uh, the area we identify as being Hamlet in now or now in future. Right. Yeah, right, right. Which is somewhat of a misnomer because there's no such thing as an edge or boundary of a Hamlet in New York State because it's. It doesn't mean we can't do that one. <laughs> it's a feeling. Yes. Hamlet is a feeling, not a. Yeah. <laughs> it has a middle, but it has no edge. Well, we're going to create a Hamlet growth boundary, so I think we're going, well, we're, we're going where others have not trod before. Central. I thought Hamlet had three acts. <laughs> uh, so the next two questions are, how long would have it, you lived? Oh. Would it be useful to include, for those who care, um, a link to a reference to see what that means? Sure. Especially if you do it online. Yeah. If somebody takes it, you can show a map, but if you do it online, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could, you could reference the planning map and say, um, you know, if you... Or you just yeah, put in, I mean, parentheses after Central Danby Hamlet, Hamlet Core, Hamlet Neighborhood, as per this link map. Yeah, if you wonder. Mm -hmm. um, I like okay. the, uh, how, how many more years do you plan to live right now? <laughs> I think it's useful for people to think about. Lots of people have lots of opinions on the uh -huh. 50 year future of a place they're going to live 10 years in. Are you going to be um, uh, making this, shall we say, a multiple choice type thing? Or are you going to have to interpret some people are talking, they'll say eight months, another one will say two thirds of a year, another one will it's, say. It's just a short, a short answer to allow short answer makes to, sense. to put in what they want. Yeah. Uh, but they could, ha, are you going to do the manual collating of all of this? If the short answer is in different terms, the program can't do that. Yeah. 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 We'll have to do the interpretation ourselves. And there, there being people help with it too. Yeah. And it, it's not the kind of thing where, for example, the median 
is particularly useful. It's right. it's it's useful on the whole mm -hmm. to get a con a sense, but it's not something that um, is it's exactly. Hard to have a, it's uh, it's hard to get a short answer to number four. Yeah. So um, number four is if you've lived in the hamlet for a long time, do you like the change that's come over the last thirty years? Why or why not? I think it's how good. many characters do you have? And that could some people will write essays. Uh, let's see. They could write an essay for sure. And that'd be it might be interesting reading if they did. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or or do you want to say limit to two hundred words or something like that? I mean single text box. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what the limit is. I'll have to look and see how adjustable, what adjustment options we have. Mm -hmm. So there might be a word limit for the, in the survey. Um, yeah. there and in certainly survey. if, if we are making paper copies, you know, I can make the box for that bigger, but it's going to ah, have right. some limit. Right, right, right. Um, but, you know, if somebody wants to go all in and write us a essay, you know, send it in. Why not? Why not? Um, they could do like some applications to have use extra pages if necessary. Sure. Yeah. I just I just did a quick check and something like Google Forms has what amounts to sliders for entering numeric values. Mm -hmm. If you want to if you wanted to make use of them, that would That's probably make your collate mm -hmm. your collection of results much easier. I think most of the responses we're gonna get are gonna be paper anyway. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Um, I would love it if I could get everyone to uh, scan the QR code and do it on their phone or something like that. But I, I think um, with Pat going around door to door, I think people are going to fill it out on paper. And we will put up a drop box outside of town hall or something for people to drop it off if they don't want to fill it out right then. Mm -hmm. And on question four, wouldn't you be interested in what they perceive as the changes having been? Not whether they like them. I think that's how I would answer that question. I would say why, you know, I don't like all the traffic, for example. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that the, the way it's phrased, I think it will elicit uh -huh. um, explanation. It says why or why not. So you don't think, mm -hmm. Ted, that that's enough um, to get people to expand on that? I do. Um, my experience with surveys is if, if maybe I, I, I look at them too carefully, but if something can be misunderstood or if something can be answered exactly as it was asked, it will happen. How do you think we should rephrase it then to get the kind of response we want? I might say, what, what are the, the, the most noticeable changes that you've seen over the past period of time? And do you like them? And why? I think that's good. Yeah, you're headed the right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that get that gets there. It will encourage a little bit longer answer, though. That's that's okay. That's good. We want we want to hear from people. Um, number five, would you like to be able to add a guest suite or accessory apartment to your property that could be used by an aging or young family member or rented out for extra income? Mm -hmm. Six, would you be interested in selling all or part of your land in the next ten years? Would you like to be on an email list about zoning changes in the Hamlet? If so, what's your email? Would you like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the town planner? If so, how should he contact you? Number six. Yeah, I have to, number six. I want to talk about that too. Number six, do you, yes. <laughs> do, you mean, do you mean property or do you mean land? The, the um, word property would be better. It, it, 
it allows the answer to go either way. <clears throat> okay. Once again, that's a multiple, I think that could be a multiple choice. The answer would be no, maybe. It could yes, happen, right. or yeah, I'm planning on it. Yeah, that's a tricky one because it could be that somebody has mm -hmm. a property, say like I have 14 acres and I'm thinking of selling, I'm gonna keep the house and sell off 10 acres. So right. that's basically the kind of information that we're yeah. trying to get at. Right. So I, don't, I wonder how we can... Well, all or part. I think so that's prompts that thought you know i mean oh, well, i might be willing to sell part of it but i'm going to keep part of it yeah, i think I you should also in, i think you should also include a, a question about whether or not they'd be interested in having information on a conservation easement um, well not in the hamlet not in the hamlet yeah <laughs> well not why not I think it is a good idea to keep it this way because then they answer, um, it, it's not a short answer questions, one or one or the other, because especially but, if it's- But property. if you own enough property, right. there are people in the Hamlet who do own enough property, right? For sure. Yes, yeah. but the Hamlet is where we oh, want the growth to happen. So why yeah. would we be asking them if they want to keep their property from being developed? Right, right, that's a bad idea. <laughs> well, uh, for what it's worth, I, I might suggest the word, um, would you, are you considering or basically a word considering instead of interested in it right. so you're not asking do you could i buy your land no you're saying would you consider it it's the same thing i i i have that consider is just the same so that has been my concern about this when i've seen this question posed in other meetings i it sounds like we're asking them if they'll if they will would sell it to us or that's what it that's what I feel when I see that. Would you be interested in selling? That's a real. That's a realtor's question. So let's what, change what that. What would be something. a better way to say it? What, how, would, be how, what would be? Yeah. What would be better? I don't know, but can, if we don't all jump all over, maybe we can think about it for a second. But I, I'm just concerned about that. It just sounds like. It sounds like a realtor question, and I'm sure I can think of something better or somebody. It else like we're, we're, it sounds almost like we're prospecting for yes. land to develop. Yeah. That's exactly what it sounds like to me and feels like. So if we can yep. just yep. think about it. That might about, be the, that might be the case though. Or the about, other option is to just say, are you, are you likely to be selling your property in the next 10 years? Uh, selling or subdividing? Selling all or part or of part. your property. Or how about do you expect to? I, I'd do like future, to think do about Do your future plans include? You know, there's so many different ways. Just yeah. It's tricky because someone might say, well, if, if I can do this, then I might consider selling part of it, you know, if I can right, develop right. it. So maybe, maybe we need to have a question, I don't know, perhaps it's coming up a little bit later in the survey about and somebody, whether they're interested in developing or seeing development, additional development on their land or developing. Right. Something I would like, like to say what it feels like, and then, then maybe as we have time to think about it, we might see some other way to say it. It feels like if somebody came up and asked me that, and I get that kind of question for Eric's property in Virginia, I mean, in Milwaukee, I got it, I get it all the time for my property in Virginia, and I got it, I still get that kind of question for my house in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And it always feels like somebody's, somebody's out to get it for their benefit, not for mine. So I, I think that I'm sure there's another way to say it, but I, for me, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's I not unlike I, I about it. It's not unlike somebody fishing for a lot. You know, would you be willing to sell me a lot? You know, um, how, yeah. how, how about simply asking for frame of mind? Do you can do you consider all or part of your property as a uh, as an converting it to income, or you know, do you, are you, do you think of your property as a lifelong thing, or do you think of it as something that you might have to sell in the future? They're all leading questions. That's yeah. the problem. They're all leading questions. Maybe can we just go on to the next and yeah. not have this yeah. one be final? Yep. Yep. They're all leading. That's the problem. It's just like a lawyer leading the lawyer leading yeah, the yeah, yeah. Getting back to the conservation easement, this this questionnaire appears to me to be for everyone, you're asking them if they live outside the hamlet or if they even live outside of the 
of the town. So why shouldn't you ask? You could even couch it by saying, if you live outside the hamlet, would you be interested in information on conservation easements? That's a fair argument, I think. It's a fair argument, although we want, it gets to the question of what are we trying to survey? Well, uh, but why ask if, just make it for people in the hamlet then and don't make it for anybody else. That's a that's a good point. And maybe we should make it just for people in the hamlet because if that's what we're trying to find out. That was, a, that was the thrust of this, wasn't it? Uh, that is the thrust of it. I, the reason that I put on the other choices is because if we put it on the internet and somebody else fills it out, I'd like to know that they don't live in the hamlet. Yeah, so we can just discount their information, so to speak. Um, we don't want to do that because if you look at this committee, uh, most people don't live in the hamlet and we're involved in making decisions or recommendations about it. And other people who don't live in the hamlet do have some information, some interest in what is in the hamlet. So it is not true. irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if you go back uh, many months and ask, why am I here? My answer was, I just like to make sure the hamlet doesn't get to where I am. So we do have an interest. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, those are all good points. The, 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 the primary thrust of this was to, because we have so few people participating from the Hamlets, um, we, wanted, we wanted to get more of a sense for what the people in the Hamlets think about these things. So, or, or I think more, more to the point is to make sure that people know about the process and know how to get involved in it and have Kind of mm -hmm. an, a little bit of extra outreach to them mm -hmm. um, so nobody there won't be anyone who hasn't heard about it i, I don't know mm -hmm. how anyone could not mm -hmm. hear about it now but i'm guaranteed there are people in that camp um, Kathy? i thought of i did play i thought of another way to say number whatever it is six, six yeah. um how do you see the future for your 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 home and your property something like that it's something that's not fishing that's one that's a different vein and maybe somebody comes up with a better way but it's a how, different how about vein. asking it in reverse do you expect if you own your property because that, that's another point i want to bring up if you own your property do you expect to to keep it for a long period tied into that question earlier about how long you plan to live in in the in the area I still think that's leading, Ted. Still sort of leading. Catherine, I like Catherine's formulation, and but maybe and then have multiple choice answers for that particular one. So you say retain ownership um, of all the land, subdivide potentially if possible or if appropriate. I mean something yes. that gets at some of those options and, and gets them to think about it. Yes, by the way, thank you for putting that one in because that makes a big difference. What, the running and owning? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, uh, yeah I was going to bring that up, so thank you. Not necessarily because we, we, we may have a lot of people who rent in the hamlet rather than own in the future. In the right, future. So, so, so any question about selling the property or uh, other things don't really right. apply. Right. Don't apply if, you're, if you don't own it. We are, exactly. Um, I think we want to keep track of the one focus on the question was 10 years. So uh, if that was the fo a focus of the question, we want to put 10 years back in. Would a statement up front to say that? We're, we're interested in what will be happening to the Hamlet areas within the next 10 years. So let people know what they're talking about. That doesn't get to what their particular property is whatsoever. Huh? Huh? That doesn't get to what they have in mind for their particular property at all. If we're talking generically what they want in the Hamlet. The question is what they want, <laughs> what they want on their property in 10 years. No, not necessarily, Pat. We want to know what they want around them and everything else about a Hamlet. I mean, this is that's that's not that question. That's a different question. Well, that's not, that's not number six. You mean, or yeah, it's not number six. Yeah, which is number seven now because we just added one. Number seven, yeah, actually. Right. Yeah. 
Well, maybe again. maybe qualify and say if you if you live in the central hamlet, you know, so people you know who who don't live in the central hamlet don't answer it. It just well, maybe at, maybe at the in the first question when you say where you live, you say if you did not check I live there. Skip to question nine. Would you like <laughs> to have a conversation? <laughs> I think the easiest thing to do is simply to, to to take the surveys that are outside the hamlet, put them in one pile, and surveys that are inside the hamlet, put them in another that's, pile. That's and, that's fair enough. Yeah, there's different of, things that will be useful from anyone outside the hamlet who fills it out may still have thoughts about how the hamlet has changed and whether they like it yeah, or not. Yeah, yeah. So it's not that um, the information isn't useful, it's just it's, it's worth knowing where it's coming from. Yeah. yeah. So um, we don't have a good resolution for seven, do we? Well, the, I, I think we have this question of, um, you know, I understand Catherine's concern that it, it feels like we're we're fishing for properties that people might want to sell, and you know, I. And maybe I, we should. I be. do want to know that. I want. I want to. If. <laughs> yeah. What, what I get. Really what I get from people all the time is why. Why am I not the manager of some master redevelopment of the Hamlet? Um, the answer being, it's all private property, and people do what they want. It's you know, we're only setting the table with zoning. Um, but I also hear from people all the time, you know, why isn't the town being more proactive in, mm -hmm. you know, buying land or connecting yes. uh, sellers with buyers and, you know, identifying I, I, the willing players. I, you know. Exactly. Yeah. I, again, I understand why this could be considered leading, but after, when you ask the question, how much longer do you expect to live in, in the Hamlet? The next question would be, do you, if you own property, do you expect to sell it at that time? Mm. All or part of it at that time when you, when you, as opposed to, a little as opposed bit, to what, least. moving away and renting it or something? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or your kids live in it. Yeah, or your kids live in it, right. I think one of the things that makes a difference is it's in the, it's in the context of rest of the rest of this um, survey, one, it's not outside by itself. Two, I think it'd be useful to uh, have a pre preamble to the survey that says that the town is redoing the zoning. And I think it's useful to note at the beginning that we're not changing the comprehensive plan, that the zoning that was approved for the comprehensive plan isn't working appropriately, so we need to revise it. That up front indicates that we're not <laughs> we're not realtors. It's worse than what you just described, Pat. We never revised the zoning for this comprehensive plan. Okay, then, but I think that should be up front, mm -hmm. an explanation of what this this whole process is for and why we're looking at the zoning. And it's also worthwhile noting that we are not revising the comprehensive plan. It's only the zoning. Not the comprehensive plan has encouraged more density in the hamlet for years. Yes, and that's correct. But our, but our regulations don't. Zoning in, into compliance with our comprehensive plan. Right. That's right. why I think I want to make sure yeah. people are aware of that because some people might argue that they don't like the comprehensive plan, but that's not what we're doing right now. No. Right. So I think it's just important to upfront, like a preamble to the survey saying, where um, the comprehensive plan exists and the zoning doesn't match it. So we're revising the zoning so it matches it better. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so, you know, seven is in fact a leading question, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that we don't want to ask a leading question because we are, we are um, kind of like a realtor looking for property. <laughs> and I have had people tell me that there I have people say why isn't the town buying up this property in the hamlet so that we can have these businesses there it's interesting well, I've actually heard yeah, them think... say why, why don't we fix up the hamlet why doesn't the town do it the hamlet nobody who would want to live in the hamlet that's a that's a often I mean that's that's yeah. there's a real some people have a very negative view of it 
Yeah. yeah. If, if I could uh, paraphrase something Rick once told, told a, a resident who didn't like the dust coming off the road, well, we would buy up all those properties, but you couldn't afford it. <laughs> mm -hmm. In other words, sure, raise the taxes, we'll buy the properties. That, that I think that is a common misunderstanding of, you know, when people, people say, why doesn't the town just do this or that? It's yes. because it costs money. <laughs> yeah, Basically, it's I think almost always going, the answer. If we're going to be buying land, then I think we should be buying land that has, I mean, in my opinion, a much more aesthetic value. Not yeah, in the hamlet. We should be going for conservation land, is what you're saying, as opposed to uh, development land. Right. Mm -hmm. But not in the hamlet. This survey is the hamlet. Yeah, right. Right. And where I don't think we're not currently at a point where the town would really be any in any position to be purchasing land. Correct. In the hamlet. Uh, I don't <laughs> think that's currently else. on on any agendas. Um, but, you know, I am in a position to help market properties to people who could do the kind of development that would be enabled by the uh -huh. zoning and that follows the comprehensive plan. Um, that's useful. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's why I want to know um, because yes. that's kind of the next step, you know, okay. after this is then trying to get people to come in enact the, the town's vision. Do what we want, do, do what we say we want. Right. But David, if the property next to the town hall came for the sale, the town would hopefully buy that or facilitate. If it if it were if it were available, and of course availability is part, partly a matter of checking into it, um, it would be something that we would I think we ought to seriously entertain. I mean, you bid on it before, and then it just fell through. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we, we're not uninterested in that property because it's, you know, it's proximity to the town hall makes it an important part of the, of the Hamlet core area. Well, let's take, for example, I don't know which property you're talking about, but let's take, for example, Chris Muka when he owned the house next door. And he said he, he said he would sell it to the town for $10,000 and Rick said absolutely not. He would not buy it. Big ten thousand dollars. He would not buy that house and okay. that land. Um, actually, this is about the second phase. After zoning is in place that makes all these things work properly, then we have to look seriously at how we implement and get this development here. So, until we get the zoning right, none of the other questions are useful. Oh, well, I don't know. I think you know, if, if that property were in play, it would be something we would we would just it would be worth having just as sort of a placeholder while we get our act together. Right. But it's not. So then it's, well, I don't know that it is. And somebody wants to look into it enough to say, well, yeah, he's willing to sell. And, 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 he, and, if, he, and if he were, it would cost it's this something. much. It'd be, not, it'd be good, informa good information to have. Yeah. Right. But in the case of Chris Muka, he was the one who was coming forward and saying, I'm interested in selling this. Would you like to it's buy true. it? I would take $10,000. And you know, now we have an owner that it seems not to be too interested in selling, at least not that he's come forward and said Yeah, Rhonda, it's, 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 what's the point of rehashing what could have been, but it did not happen? Correct, correct, correct. I'm just giving you the history of the property. And and yeah, the town, the the town could have bought the school for $60,000 too, but we didn't do that either. And the no, no, no. of the survey sure to get the information about who is willing to sell, including that person. Yep. Yeah. The answer yeah. to that question will give us what we need about that property. Yep. Yeah, I think I think those are those are all good points. Um, yeah, I'd love to scroll down to uh, more questions, but there. Did you did you ask did you add number nine, David? I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm more than happy to sit down with people. I I think that's a good way to go because. Yes. From every yeah, sure. process like this I've been involved in, I guarantee there's a lot of people out there who have been already told something that's completely not true about yeah, the zoning right. update. Um, and if they want questions about what does this mean for me, what better way than to ask guys putting it together? Yep. Yes. Are there more questions? 
There are not more questions. There, there was a list of values that I thought about listing and having people uh, either say, you know, this is very important, not important, kind of important um, to me, or um, have it, have them put them in a row, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one through ten. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. One through five. You know, very important to unimportant. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about some questions about, you know, ranking your top five desire for services in the town, um, businesses? I don't want to ask people for their thoughts about something that I can't deliver to them. Mm -hmm. But it, it's helpful. I mean, if say, if everybody puts cafe first, I mean, then you know, then the town knows, well, we really want to go and see if we can find a developer who can deliver that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's very, everywhere I've been, what do people want? They want a cafe, microbrewery, and a grocery store. Right. And I think <laughs> probably the one I most likely to have any success with is a microbrewery. Uh -huh. <laughs> But Some might ask for a dollar store. Who knows? I mean, it may be that that's something, or a gas station again, or a marijuana dispensary. I don't know. I would. I think most people would be happy for the cafe or a brewery or a restaurant. But I'm just wondering whether we should just put the question out there. I think that that question could be answered by that one about do you see what changes have you seen or like. Yeah, like, that's true. They, they put it in there. Well, what if we ask people what changes they would like to see? Yeah. Yeah. We ask them what they what happened idea. that they liked or didn't yeah. like. We could ask I like that or, because you know most people don't like change. So getting them to think about what kind of change they might actually welcome or, yeah. or be willing to tolerate would be a very useful question. And it doesn't lead them into specific things that they we think they should want. Right. It'd be so nice to we're not restricting it to the hamlet. We're just saying for the community as a whole. For yeah. the, hamlet. Oh, in the hamlet. No. Okay. Hamlets or hamlets, yeah. And that could be anything from uh, you know sidewalks and street lights to uh, you know. up the garbage or yeah. Lower the speed limit. I'm sure we'll get a lot of those. Yeah. In, in water, city water, and we'll we'll hear everything. How about mm -hmm. yeah? Could could you move that yeah. up to be after the the other question about changes? Yep. Yeah. Right. So I thought I'd I'd put up this list that I shared with. Pat, when we talked uh, a week ago. Um, yes. Trying to find I'm not the, sure how useful that would be. Um, I like open ended more where it says, What would you like? Because rather than focusing on specific things, they can be open about what they look at. Uh -huh. I'm not sure I follow, Pat. What do you mean there? I like the open-ended question we just made. What, yeah. what changes oh, would you okay. like? Okay. I mean, there also, you could put in, and why you like those changes, that could give you to the values part of it. That's that would true. be useful as well. Do you want yes. to ask something about sidewalks? Because, I mean, no. you could ask a question like, would you like to have sidewalks in the hamlet, even if it meant taking some of your front yard. Hmm. No, I think we're a long ways away from asking yeah. that question. Yeah, it's way too far away for that. Well, that's one of those don't ask if you can't do anything about it questions. Right. right. And it's and it's more reasonable for for part two and when the zoning's in place and then figure yeah. what to get and how to get it best that's where it would come up mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, I think where we're at with questions is actually really good. And I, I think this values ranking, I kind of decided before, but I, I think it's probably not as useful. Um, maybe it's a separate exercise for another time. In, in some ways, the, uh, the values makes more sense for the comprehensive plan than for mm -hmm. the zoning that implements the comprehensive plan. Right. We really already have, have that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think you're right, Pat. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I, I think we've had some great conversation about that survey, and I, I think it's in a good place. Um, I'll work on adding that preamble, Pat, maybe like a little cover page for yeah, it fine. and um, get you something that you can take around. Um, and you know, if anyone is interested in um, doing that work in West Amby, um, let I'll me know. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. Um, Great. David, how is this survey now supplanting the one that you had sent out previously? That or, survey no. was not for the Hamlet. That was survey that was for the non-Hamlet areas. That was a commercial, yeah. It, right, so the, so that's separate. I mean, I still haven't filled it out. I apologize. Gonna put you in timeout. <laughs> um, the, so the other survey was specifically commercial uses outside of the hamlet okay. um, and we've been working in this group about categorizing commercial uses in the hamlet and it's pretty broad what's allowed there but we were getting feedback that people wanted more commercial uses in other parts of the town and different ones ones that aren't necessarily walkable or um, yeah would make or, sense or suited for the center of the hamlet is it too late to submit it still no go ahead i just got uh one yesterday so Go ahead and take a look at it and um, put in your two cents. It's always helpful. How, how many total so far? Let me look. I didn't do it either, Olivia, so you're not the only one. <laughs> you're in good company. Uh, 29. Yeah. Oh. And <laughs> If we get up to 40, we have to pay more money. Is that right? <laughs> it looks like we might be safe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let me get back to what are we going to talk about next? Can you give an update on the, um, the engineering project for the water? Uh, very little, um, other than that we are working on the startup paperwork. There's a lot of, anytime you get state money, gosh, is there a lot of paperwork in it. I was uh, somewhat surprised by how much more, I think our, our consultants um, said there wouldn't be very a whole lot. There's, there's some more things that we have to get through to get the contract signed, um, but Joel and I have reviewed and agreed on the scope from them and gotten all the approvals from the town board that we need to move forward. Um, so it's really in uh, just in getting the administrative stuff done to, to get them started. Um, and then following up with the, the various locations. Um, but, so what is the scope of work now? Uh, let me see if I can, I could pull it up. Uh, it's probably not gonna not gonna find it quickly in the middle of the meeting, but um, I'd be happy to share it with you, Olivia, if you want okay, to take thank a look you. at it. Um, really, the the broad broad brush um, components of it is that they're gonna help us look at um, broadly at the kind of legal and um, physical components of adding. Um, wastewater treatment um, that can be either shared between small parcels that don't have capacity on their land or that could be larger. Um, we'll look, they will work with us to look at several sites around the hamlet um, that have capacity. 
um, I think you and I have talked about um, the possibility of looking on the land that you own. We've talked about land the town owns. I've talked to a few other landowners. Um, I was disappointed that the Dobson site was not in a position where they were ready to have any work done there. Um, but I will follow up with them and see if things have clarified. Um, Dobson or the Dobson Park? Dobson. Yeah. The deceased uh, Dobson. Yeah, Dobson, not right. Dodson. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's just wastewater treatment. It's not also so that we're still assuming that um, people would be drawing on well water. Yes. Okay. And you know, it, you could look at both sides. You know, you can you can You're be more well, efficient. Too. You can be more efficient with septic if you have a shared drinking water system, and you can be more efficient with drinking water systems when you have a shared uh, wastewater system. Um, I think you, the wastewater system is a bigger restriction than the well. Um, you know, it's nice to be able to put, you can put wells, I think, 100 feet apart. It's not, it's not nearly as much of a restriction as the area required by individual septic fields and then the distancing mm -hmm. to wells. Um, so it's wastewater, I think, is a bigger component. Sometimes drinking water is an easier one to access. Um, but uh, either way, um, out of that uh, will come both information for the town about development capacity um, and potential projects, as well as um, ideas for things that could be funded. You know, there's money available for actual capital improvements. So if um, including the ARP in, in the American Rescue Plan funds or water and wastewater, one of the categories that are not limited to trying to recover losses due to COVID. Mm -hmm. For municipalities, it's available. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we were able to combine, you know, it's a kind of interesting situation because we don't really have people that need to get onto it without development. But if uh, we could combine our efforts and find development projects that need the infrastructure um, that could coalesce together, you know, we, could, we can work towards that. So you know, it's just a start, but I, I do think it has potential. And, and David, for the, um, I think you saw the email from me about Ben Rosenblum offering to do some rendering for based on the guidelines. So the American Rescue money wouldn't cover anything like that. It's pretty limited what you can use it for. It's, e it's either things that you can document are losses of revenue because of COVID since March of 2021 because our uh, earlier losses were supposed to be covered by other the other money that came through before or the unrestricted parts or less restricted parts are water and wastewater and uh and broadband and there's quite a bit of interest in doing something about the broadband part too to extend broadband to underserved and unserved um so i I think that was what I uh, <laughs> remember where we are at. You got me a little, a little off um, there. With that. The, the other uh, thing that we were going to pick up and look at is just where we were at um, with the draft zones. Um, so I, I'm glad that we got through the, the survey quickly um, and we can go back to back. where we're at. Sorry, I heard somebody. No. no. Uh, we could go back to further reviewing the, the draft zones unless there's an, another more pressing topic anyone wants to bring up. One second to bring up the documents. Hmm. We were working our way through the, uh, not just, not so much the, the where as the as the what of it, you know, the, the, the regulations within it, right? That's correct. Let's 
and we really have gotten through much of it. So what's what, do kinda... have, what do we talk about the roofs? Did we ever? The well, roof? we, I think like many things in it so far, we've had lots of conversations and questions and less, um, less yeah. resolve around making any particular changes. Um, mm -hmm. There hasn't, we haven't had a lot of coalescing of agreement around something that should be different. Looking at that building behind you, David, that's probably a 612. A little less. A little less. Yeah, Greek yeah. Revival tends to be on the lower slope continuum exactly. compared to the Victorian tradition that right. there's a fan of. Um, um, for, for what it's worth, are you talking roof slopes? Um, you all know what I mean by the green cube that's building on um, Beardley Lane. The green cube even on the corner, you mean? Yeah. Which lane? I mean, on Beard Beardsley. Um, are, you, are you using zip sheathing? Is that why you're talking about the green cube? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, you, Joel, you probably remember that the original design was a cube. Pretty much, and, yeah. And the, as I understand it, the the, uh, the peaked roof was added at the insistence of the neighborhood association, turning something ugly into something really ugly. <laughs> you mean the one on 96 B that's kind of in, in um... on the corner? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, that is that... horrible. Yeah, I mean, I thought the maybe they put the roof on so they could see the lake or something. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's really a sore thumb. My daughter asked me if it's a hotel. <laughs> she asked you it what? Will, if it's a hotel. The, oh. The belief is that it will be a hotel, a a a, 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 a large scale B and B. That's the belief. It may not be true. Yeah, actually, it would have looked a lot more proportional without the roof. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so the I think the passage in the the zoning that we are talking about. We were in the Hamlet neighborhood form requirements section. Right. Um, and one of those requirements is that new buildings in the Hamlet neighborhood, this is not in the Hamlet center zone. Um, new buildings must have a peaked roof of at least 812 pitch um, or architectural brackets every four feet supporting a roof of less than 812 pitch or an architectural cornice facing the street. So that's three options. They can mm -hmm. have a steep, relatively steep pitched roof, um, which is common in Victorian yep. tradition or other um, traditional, uh, many of the traditional forms, not including Greek revival, which usually has less, um, or brackets that add some detail beneath the Yeah, roof. so I mean, it, like, like the uh, Italianate form of Victorian houses would have a lower slope, but then, you know, probably hip roof, but they would have brackets. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, cup cupolas too. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, or a cornice that would hide any, um, more of a Main Street type building that would hide any peak. Um, you could have a lower are you slope. Are you, are, you, uh, are you talking parapet? A uh, parapet with like a wall, yes, with a cornice, which is a, a detailed finish yeah. at the top of a parapet. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if it, uh, a, a cornice could be, it could be, I mean, something wraps all the way around the building. It don't usually is. Uh, you know, one of, one of those fake things that they use to make uh, uh, cheap commercial buildings look better. Well, yeah, that's what the parapet like usually that. is, where you have yeah. a... Typically, you've got a you've got a, a a more imposing front facade with a wall that sticks up past the roof, basically, and then the roof slopes back from there towards the back of the property. Uh, so the, yeah. from the front, all you see is the is the is the is the facade, <laughs> which yeah, usually I, includes. I think the, I think uh, what's common in um, that's what used current, to be anyway. the current trends in big and medium box commercial. I would say is a bastardization of an architectural cornice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're oversized and poorly detailed, but yes. 
but the same in uh, the same attempt to present an imposing uh, or impressive face to the public street. Yeah, right. and also to, to have some detail at the top. One of one of the things about um, traditional building design is that there's uh, the concept of the base, middle, and top. Um, mm -hmm. That there's you put detail at the bottom, then you have a relatively simple middle, and you put detail at the top. Those are the places that make the most sense to invest money in the facade. Um, because they uh, are the most important visual components of the design. Mm -hmm. Joel, I looked up the definition of a cornice, uh, whereas a parapet is a vertical addition, which hides the roof, a cornice is a horizontal projection that hides the roof. That's why I asked. Yeah, so it, it, it... I was wondering whether this was actually intended a par uh, parapet or whether it intended where it really was intended to be a cornice. It, it, yeah, yeah. Well, they are and frequently the pictures... associated. I would say a cornice goes on the front of a parapet. That, that could be. Um, it doesn't I have to. Um, the, the pictures that it shows um, are strictly horizontal. So but... this, this is a cornice. Yeah. Yes. Which could and be on a there. parapet, but it need not be. Um, I think that the the the, uh, the the former store building ac uh, across the street from me here in West Danby has a has a parapet with no cornice. Yeah, B buildings frequently lose their cornices over time um, because they're details, and it's easier to just throw some siding up there. Um, I, d I doubt it ever had it because it was a pretty simple build building from the get go. But um, but they look a lot. There's some there's some nice examples of parapets with cornices in in Candor. Mm. And uh, I think Newfield's got a couple of buildings like that too. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. um, so I I guess that that leaves us with. You know, people were saying, oh, well, uh, lesser pitch is something that we do have some of. And should we, should we reduce the requirement um, to a lower number? Um, I, I think that in that conversation, I explained that we want, we do want to have something that includes some architectural interest or we'll, we'll get the very cheapest Thing that yeah, if you just go with a 412 do. pitch, you're going to get double wides. Right. You have double wide manufactured or double wide. Um, um, what the two kinds? Modular. Modular is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah, and there, I think that we don't want to make it impossible for someone to use modular technology, but that we do want uh, the front of the building to have some. Um, quality that contributes to the community. You can do anything with modulars. It doesn't have to be double wide. No. What does this have to do with the Hamlet? This We're is a about form the... requirement for the Hamlet neighborhood zone. Yeah. And the point of having a form requirement is so that we have some assurance that what gets built in the Hamlet will be attractive. Right. Because we are, we are unlocking a lot of potential. We're removing barriers in the zoning, but we we don't, the point isn't to say absolutely anything goes. We're desperate to get any development we can. We do still want to have some things that make the development that we get um, human scaled and people friendly. And, and, and I mean, would, we could, with these rules, I mean, there's nothing to keep anybody from doing a trailer park. But there are commercial buildings that, you know, you know, old fashioned brick buildings that don't really have sloped roofs or just like the ones I sent you, David, from um, Hammond's Court. Um, I'm just going to see if I can look it up again. I'm sure they like have a, a cornice. Let's go with Pittsford. Hmm. And it, you, the intent is to have this to apply to 
all buildings, including resi private residences? Yes. Yeah. It mostly applies to private residences. Yeah, this is the Hamlet neighborhood, so it's intended to be primarily residential. Oh, okay, all right. Personally, I would support reducing it to six and 12, but I'm open. My garage is six and 12, okay. <laughs> For what it's worth, anything steeper than about six and 12 is hard to walk on. You have to use you know, staging or. So I'm just looking at the, the photo from Hammond's court and there's like a brick building and if you look at it from the front, it's two story and has big, you know, plate windows and the, the first floor and then the second floor has, you know, other windows, but it, it just, it has a flat um, facing mm -hmm. um, facade towards the road. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good illustration of what you got. Um, I, I can send it to you, David, if you can put it up then. Sure, I'd be happy to. I'll just forward it to you quickly. Uh, on screen now is a, an image of what the various pitches are. So 8, 8, 12 is this one, 6, 12, you know, it, it's kind of hard. You can definitely see the difference as you go. You know, well, yeah, I think yeah, most right. of us can tell the difference between a 12, 12 and a 5, 12. Um, the difference between eight and six is not substantial. Um, well, those it, start to look a little flat compared to, you know, steeper roofs. Yeah. Is there a, um, a building code thing or, or any rule architectural design uh, rule of thumb that says what how steep the pitch has to be in order to use that space as living quarters? No. No, it has more to do with the height underneath I, it. Yeah, the ceiling height. height the ceiling height to talk, governs whether it's whether it's uh, um, counted occupied. as uh, occupied space. Uh, uh, I'm gonna stop well, sharing so I can. So I mean, it could be it could be it could be practically flat. It'd still be okay as far as that goes. The the relevant thing is that uh, shingles are not um, advised for roofs under 312. Mm -hmm. So ma manufactured homes are generally 312. Um, modular homes are generally 412. Subtle difference, but um, you can you can kind of tell which is which just by looking at the slope of the roof. Yeah, this is a nice example of a parapet. That's a parapet, yep. Mm -hmm. right, look like my the side. one on the far left you call that a parapet yeah it mm -hmm. sticks up above the roof plane see? right but and the one on the far right is that also a parapet like you can't it's a parapet with a cornice on it at this yeah. angle it's hard to say it probably is a parapet as well but that would be permitted in the hamlet core right yes yeah mm -hmm. it'd be permitted in the hamlet neighborhood as well yeah it's exactly what we're trying to get yeah okay a corner store or something. Yeah. Right. So I'm gonna close that. It kind of it kind of suggests commercial building when it's got the parapet. Mm -hmm. It does, and we, we are allowing some commercial. Um, yeah. Limited commercial, but also I I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a terrible way to do to deal with a residential building either. Which is it's less common, but. Um, yeah, I think we, we have the three options. You can have brackets if the slope is low or similar architectural detailing, or you can have uh, detailing of the top if it's flat, or you can have it be a steeper pitch. Now the question, could you do a Greek revival? Is there not, not enough of a cornice? Well, Greek revival frequently has bracketing or dentals. Dentals. You don't have that much of a pitch, the Greek revivals. No, that's what I'm saying. The Greek revivals are usually 412, 312, something that, you know, they're not very steep. 
uh, because they usually they typically have temple fronts. Mm -hmm. Which is also considered a cornice, although it, it's a different kind of cornice. Is it? Mm -hmm. There aren't too many people building Greek revivals anymore, though. Although I did think about it. I know some excellent people designing and, and building them in other places, not so yeah. much here. Yeah. They're, com they're popular for new development in the South. OK. Um, you know, the, the way that the, uh, the commercial design guidelines that the town currently has deals with it is it just says you have to be built in a traditional style that's common in the area. And it lists a few, Greek Revival, Victorian, uh, Federal. Um, I propose Correct. these requirements as a way to still allow modern buildings while requiring some details. Architects frequently really hate this because they really want to be able to build a building with no details because they think that's super cool um, to be like the iPhone of buildings, zero mm -hmm. detail. Um, what are you saying, zero... David? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'd say my personal philosophy is that it's very, very difficult to do a very good low detail building. And it's yes, very, it very easy to do an okay high detail building. Um, and I would prefer to err on the side of assuming that we don't have a lot of REM cool houses and that um, requiring some details is a good backstop to keep keeping things um, pretty good. That's my goal, it's always pretty good. The city of Ithaca must have some fairly restrictive um, guidelines now for their infill. I'm seeing quite a lot more infill happening. Yeah. I, they don't have any Restricted not guidance. really. This the city. The city they doesn't have a very challenging planning board. Yeah, they have. I would say one of the most negotiated development ecosystems. Yeah, they sure do. Mm -hmm. um, which is very expensive and difficult to um, get the guys up the cost of everything. Really, yeah, there's, it does. No Although it does. It does result in some pretty good projects, though. There's a lot of a lot of the recent construction downtown. It looks, in my eye, looks pretty nice. To think outside the box for a moment, we're talking about visual design requirements. Would it be useful to be thinking about practical requirements, um, like what? In other, in other words, design your roof so that it's energy efficient? Would that be would that would that not be as important as the way it looks? Well, that's that's um, that's a given because you, you have to comply with the with the uh, with the energy code as well as with the construction code. Right. And, we and did. to that point, I think the town did recently consider adopting the stretch energy code, or another the city recently adopted a green building code um, that I helped yeah, write. Yeah, city adopted green. Uh, town of Dryden just adopted the stretch code. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and I think those are a better way than zoning to deal with that stuff. Um, but I I think the, the what the town decided most recently is to not do that. Um, really, what the the purpose of the form requirements are to um, affect the buildings in the way that they affect the public realm, not in the way that they operate privately. So it's not about what's inside. It's not about the sides or the back. It's really about the front and the space that gets created between the fronts of buildings across the street from each other. Yeah. Fair, and fair enough. For what it's worth, it's, it's worth mentioning that the uh, energy considerations drive the designs towards simplicity because they're easier to construct in detail uh, in an energy efficient way, the less you the less you um, articulate them, you know, the fewer penetrations, the fewer gables, the fewer wings, you know, the, the, the closer you come to a box, um, the easier it is to, to get it airtight and well insulated. Yeah, and the um, new energy code is, it's very difficult actually for a lot of people to meet, period, um, much less going further. I mean, it's definitely been a learning curve for a lot of the designers and builders in our area. 
um, mm -hmm. and it, it increases by the state increases it on a schedule. Um, so what's currently the stretch energy code will be the new energy code before too long. I'm gonna go ahead, Ted. Does the energy code, I mean, coming right back to the pitch question, mm -hmm. do energy considerations push toward a steeper or a shallower pitch? We shouldn't be making things look good if we're and at the same time make it difficult to achieve energy efficiency. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Yeah, I mean, a steeper pitch, you can have more insulation under it. Um, there's, there's a certain pitch for our latitude that would be ideal for solar panels. To solar, get the most right, sun. Which, is, which is close to 45, which is, which is higher more. pitch. 12, 12. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can also, you don't have to mount panels flat on the roof. So it's um, right. You know, I, I have written codes that required solar ready orientation of building roofs. Um, yes. Which would actually be quite reasonable in Dan because that road runs pretty darn close to north south. Well, yeah, well, yeah but we're not necessarily talking existing roads, though. So, um. <laughs> I also th think, you know. With the technology of uh, community solar now, you know, I I rent and I have community solar. Um, and I'm not sure it's it's much more efficient to do that way than to put a system on every roof. Although I think it's great for people to put it on their roofs. Um, it's it's more efficient to construct, but in the long term, cost effectiveness is much better if you put it in yourself. For for you as the owner. You for you, yeah, for the individual. But, yeah. You know, cost of ownership is much better. Yeah. No, but, well, which it. raises which raises the other other point that I, I was kind of quibbling about, I think, the last time is that is the requirement of street trees uh, and the potential for limiting the ability to do solar on south facing roofs. If they happens to be and you know, the street trees on the south side of the house which on an east-west street, it would be half the time. Uh, unless you're willing to limit the height of the trees, which, you know, practically speaking, what happens is that the trees are limited in, by the presence, if you've got it, um, which, does, do the guidelines address uh, overhead utilities? They do, they give an exemption for overhead utilities. From um, the tree requirement. But they don't require the, but they don't require that there be un, uh, buried utilities. No. Because that would certainly add to the aesthetics considerably if we could bury the electric instead of having overhead, um, you know, utility poles and wires. I, I would certainly appreciate to see that that kind of the buried utilities. That does change the look so much. It drives costs, though. Um, One's very. Ex I mean, just getting developers to build roads is very, very expensive. Yes. And then we can address that as well um, by making it the road road specs narrower. Uh, Very utilities mean don't mean you don't have power outages so often either. This is true. You don't worry about the tree branches falling onto the branch onto the wires. Yeah, I'm not sure how much that would affect the power outages that we'd experience in the hamlet because all the lines that run to it are not buried. Yes, so, well, that's true. That could be changed over time as well with <laughs> one would hope. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot of density to make that value proposition make sense. It doesn't even make sense in most of the city um, to bury utilities. It just basically the commons and college town are the only places and they've that, got it, you know. that it's financially feasible. The rest of the neighborhoods, my neighborhood, looking out the window at um, poles on lines. And it's a little cheaper to do it up front than to retrofit later. Um, but the Beardsley yeah. Lane, the Beardsley Lane subdivision has buried utilities. Yeah. Old Town is buried. I don't know. Is is um what's Fields, the other Fields one Town. that's just down the road? Fieldstone and, Circle. Yeah, yeah, is that buried? I think that's buried too. Southern Southern Comfort is buried. What is Southern Comfort? Comfort, south of me. 
Oh, okay. No, it's not the dirt part. The okay. dirt part. Uh, yeah. bourbon. <laughs> so it may not be unreasonable to think that way, because I mean, otherwise you're, you know, that's one of the constraints in the city is you, and you know, we've got the hood electric, you, your, your street trees are limited to things that aren't going to grow up into the wires. Mm -hmm. Or they occasionally do dumb things like plant trees that will grow up in the wires and turn them into U-shaped trees by and by um, to accommodate the wires going through the middle of them. But, um, that yeah, there's one tree on, is it Nelson? I think it's Nelson. Or by the time they trimmed it, I thought the whole tree was going to just fall over because it was so oh. lopsided. Yeah, I've got some like on, that over here too. Yeah, yeah the, on the uh, north-south section of Sandbank uh, before it takes a dive down the hill. <laughs> it's one of those beautiful U-shaped trees. Yeah. Then I, I, you know, you've got them running down uh, Seneca Street with the with the uh, the honey locusts, basically mm -hmm. with holes in the middle for the accommodating the wires. Yeah. So, what do you think about requiring buried electric in new new streets? I think it's hard to require it. I think you should recommend it, urge it, encourage it. But I don't. Yeah. Think I I think it's a good design guideline. I, I'm hearing a lot of concern from people about affordability and about, yes. you know, we are restricting growth in a lot of the town and we don't want it to be so exclusive that there's nothing affordable that can be built. Right. And, and one of the main drivers is we want to make it easier uh, and cheaper to do in the hamlets in order to encourage it to happen at all. Yeah. Well, my two cents is about roof lines. What's that? My two cents is I'd rather see buried cables than worry about roof lines. But the two of them, they are they're, they're separate questions. Yeah, I mean uh, Nate's Floral Estates in in Ithaca mm -hmm. is a mobile home park. I think they got buried utilities there. And it uh, is highly regarded by its, it, by, its, by its residents and by many who do not live there as an affordable, you know, attractively, reasonably attractively landscaped residential neighborhood mm -hmm. in the city near services. You can walk to Wegmans. Those are mobile homes. Um, um. I don't know about it being buried utilities. So um, they may have some utilities buried, but. Um, Did Mike, does Mike Kovanek bury his utilities on that, on his um, mobile home park? This is, this is Nate's. And there's definitely wires going over it. I don't know if that, if they, have wires. Yeah, there's a transmission yeah. corridor there. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a good thing to suggest. I just don't want it to be a, a stumbling block to getting the denser development that we want in the hamlet. Mm -hmm. We don't have no idea of the cost, do we? The difference, no. Not off the top of my head. Because um, um. I'm kind of leaning Ted's way, which is to say, I, I think I, I think having a clutter of wires out of the way is maybe maybe more important to the aesthetics of it than than the slope of the roof. Well, eight eight years ago or so, uh, this is a private cable as opposed to a public cable, but it was about $2 a foot to get it all done. You're talking about running the line to your house? Yeah, you know, the, the, that's the cost of the cable, the conduit, and the digging. What do you do about retrofitting, say, like on my properties, they're already um, electric poles. Right. So if, if someone grandfathered, grandfathered you can't. Yeah, they're grandfathered. Oh. I mean, we're not. We're talking about new construction here. Um, you know, if yeah. you put somebody puts in a new street, 
But if you're if you're saying what about a new house on a street that already has um, above ground wires, uh, NYSEG will run a cable down the pole to underground. They can. Yeah, you have the option when when you do a new house, you can either you can either run underground to your house or you can run overhead. And if you, and I remember I remember the guy who works with me um, weighing which was which was the better one because they were not that different in price, but especially if you have to add a pole to get there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. If you have to add a pole, you, you almost might as well run underground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, according to Power Grid International, the cost difference for running per mile overhead transmission or underground line um, difference can be between four and 14 times more expensive to put it underground than to put it on poles. Um, okay. that, may, that may be true for public lines, but for private lines, uh, NYSEG wanted a pole every few hundred every few hundred feet at about fifteen hundred dollars a pole. It was much cheaper to run it underground. Right, but I think but what we're talking about, line. right? What we're talking about is the public lines. Yeah. I, I, are we sure you were not talking about uh, in between that? You the poles, as I heard that Ted saying, if the pole is there, you run the wire down, versus what. It, when I heard you say, David, and, and again, I don't know whether we're not talking about the whole municipality being underground. I mean, although I like that, but if you if you're talking about poles to a to a development, or are you talking about the whole development being buried? I guess that's what you're talking about. We're or talking about the development, the development. Okay. So if if someone, that's not a great example since Russ has his. Uh, property option to the solar developer, but if someone were developing Russ's property as a neighborhood, right. like, you know, like Old Town Village, but denser and smaller lots, um, would they be required to run on those new streets, um, all the utilities underground or above ground? Gotcha. Can they use the same trench? Is it that kind of economy? The same trench as what? Water. Oh. Sewer, if there is one. It's not like highly recommended, but you, I think technically you can stack them, but you would have to like cap one and then cap the other. I just wonder whether there's an economy is if you were doing a development and you were, you know, digging trenches, you would, you would have to have one for, one for water, one for electric, one for you probably won't be running gas. Yeah, the the reference you uh, found, David, refers to um, sixty nine kilovolt overhead transmission lines, as which is <laughs> uh, as opposed it, to distribution it, lines. Yeah, as opposed to distribution line, it's uh, yes, putting those those high voltage, seriously high voltage stuff underground is is a technical issues it's not the same with things that would be within our hamlet it would have you got something there for distribution lines as opposed to transmission I, I'm, I'm reading through the uh an article here but it's it's not really saying so yeah. there's it does, some limitations on distance too where like yeah because once you get too far then your power source is not as strong yeah. say it again if you get your wires too long from like where the transformer is, then you have to put in another power. transformer. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. There, the, yeah. This article, which references the article that David had, um, is, is, it's really intended for people putting in major work. Uh, let's see if I can try a different search. Um, um, uh, while you're looking, I will say that every single thing in Reston is underground. The entire, the entire Reston is all underground. Um, Never and I hear what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about, David, about expensive expenses. But 
if there were some incentives, you know, we, I don't think we can decide this whole thing right now, but we could we could wish for it and and ask for it to be something that people would consider for the future. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's willing to put that, I mean, if I had the option for my house, my own in the development, I'd probably opt for it rather than having a line. I mean, if said people said they wanted to, great. I mean, in the context of climate change right now, I mean, if I just think of the storms that we had in the last two weeks, I mean, mm -hmm. it really makes a lot of sense to um, to get the lines underground. It's uh, yeah. a huge tree. I mean, we lost a huge branch um, from a maple tree, and um, Mark Berger, the, uh, his whole uh, poplar went over. It almost went on his solar installation. Wow. Um, so I, I think just from that perspective, it's probably wise. It's a good yeah. investment. The Wikipedia article uh, begins to talk about lifetime cost. And that's mm -hmm. where maintenance and, and accidents become a big figure. And they, they say the lifetime cost difference for low voltage distribution networks, which is what we we're talking about, is on the range of 12 to 28% higher than overhead lines. So it, the, at that point, it, it's not that much of a difference. Right, but that takes the entire lifetime of less maintenance to make up the right. upfront. True. The upfront costs are still meaningful. Yeah, that, that's true. Yep, it's one, it's one of those one of those drivers. There's so many drivers of you know why is why is housing so expensive? You know, the, the, you can't build a house the way it was built 100 years ago. And uh, which would be a whole lot cheaper than we we have to build them now. Not to mention that dollars aren't worth as much now. Is that true? But I'm, I'm talking even constant dollars. You know? And I hear the cost of lumber is half of what it was a few months ago. Well, uh, yeah, the price of sticks is dropping, but not OSB yet. Right. Here's just another, another example of, for comparison, um, cost per mile for a single phase. Um, yeah, which is what we probably would have in most developments. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's significant. Um, it's not the end of the world, but I- well, $10,000 for a mile, um, you could get a lot of houses in a mile of road. Yep. Yes. Yes, that that it's actually a good point. That if you were if you were building a new street with a dozen houses, this is either number mm -hmm. is small. Any of those numbers. Yeah, I mean, I would say this is a, if anything, a compelling argument for wanting it on the ground. Most people who are going to be developing aren't going to be going even a mile, likely. Just behind their house or right right i mean you're not going to we're, we're talking we're talking well if you put if we, if we added a mile of road and if the lots were you know quarter acre or less that's a lot of houses in a mile i'm not sure where we're going to do that well think of think of uh, rick dobson's property I mean, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm just talking, you know, cost per mile. We might not, not add a mile of road. Well, you might, yeah, but that's a lot of blocks. D David's saying, what, a block is 300 and some odd feet, David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, two to 700. The loop, of, mm -hmm. the loop of Old Town is just under half a mile, if you don't count old, um, buttermilk lane. So if you do like the loop plus buttermilk lane, it's about a mile. Yeah. And that would have been Fifteen thousand dollar expense. Yeah, that's negligible in the cost of that development. Mm -hmm. They'll probably spend more on advertising. <laughs> and we're looking at, I hope, considerably higher. You'll spend more. That. You'll spend more on one roof. I'll tell you that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You'll spend more on the on the um, on the uh, catered food for the grand opening. <laughs> Uh, so it sounds 
like people are there is some coalescing that we haven't had a lot of discussion about it or thought about it around making this a requirement for the hamlet that's different from the rest of the town that adds this as an extra hurdle is that where you want to go i would say yes yeah but why just the hamlet i mean you know somebody puts in a subdivision say up on east miller road and puts in a lot of houses why should they not have to do it it's even more important in the open spaces yeah, why shouldn't we why shouldn't we require it of any new road? I mean, especially in areas if you're putting houses in with you know large open space. Mm -hmm. um, right now we're working on these guidelines for the Hamlet. So that yeah. is appropriate, but that's next week's meeting. <laughs> yeah, we could bring it to next week's meeting, but you know. Good point, Pat. But I mean, but I agree. I mean, there's no reason why we want to make it more expensive in the Hamlet than outside the Hamlet. So if we're going to make a requirement in the Hamlet, we should make a requirement outside of the Hamlet as well on new streets. Bring it up next week. It's a good, good point. Let me add one small nuance that if when you're running electricity, when you're running electricity or other utilities, um, it would be really forward thinking to run a couple of fiber, a couple of fiber cables at the same time. Very um, small. Be. Yes, that's right. Do you have to have a vendor already for that, or how does that work? If you, if you just have the fiber there and ready for use, um, even if even if it's connected to nothing, you know, fiber is again, you know, not a pennies, not a small number, but pennies per foot. But Ted, is that something that private companies don't they generally run it? Do municipalities themselves run it? Well, we're talking about um, putting in a countywide fiber, dark fiber network where the we might do it as a public utility, running yeah, fiber it, down it all the streets, and then and then and then have the the uh, internet service providers compete for the uh, customer access, you know, from those lines to the customer, you know, to each individual house to provide the service. Oh, but the, the most the most difficult part of that is is getting the last few feet, not even miles of drops. So having that installed as, as a matter of as a matter of practice, it, it gets you somewhere. Yeah. I, I, I wish I, 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 I wish I had buried fiber myself because if and when we ever get a fiber to Comfort Road, yeah. it's going to be a hell of an expense to, but to add it now. Right. You talked to Pat about that same situation. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> so worth considering as a, as an additional spec for, for you know, new roads. It's not clear to me if we're talking about anybody that puts in anything new has to run uh, cables underground. If that's what the argument is. Um, if, say that again. Say it's again, not clear no. to me if you say um, anything new, any new house on another property would have to on the same property would have to have uh, underground lines. Is that what we're talking about? Anything new? No, we're talking. Electric? We're talking about the. We're talking about the public space. You know, getting the getting electricity, getting the fiber um, distributed through a new development along mm -hmm. the road not the oh. connection from the house to it. Although in the context of next week's discussion, perhaps the uh, existence of a, when you when a cluster gets invoked, whatever the rules are for that, yeah. that might be a trigger for having underground. Yeah, it's an interesting point because we are not, uh, and I'd have to have, I wanna have this discussion with David about, you know, we, we are, we're, we're, we're thinking clustering as opposed to cluster subdivision not the same thing. Um, this is the first time I've ever suggested, seen a stage that they could be divorced. Uh, so, you know, you can have a, you could, you could have a cluster of houses under, as, as we're currently proposing things, which are all on one property and, and don't involve a subdivision. 
That's right. Um, that, and, that was and, my point. As soon yeah. as you put that second house on your property, you're tr you're triggering it's clustering provision. Yeah. Yeah. And and buried cables. Could be part of it. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if you're if you're doing outbuildings, you typically do them that way too. Although you know, I, I have a house on Hillview Road where they in in the in the old days they ran overhead electric to the chicken coop and overhead electric to the garage and overhead electric to the barn. You know, nowadays we almost certainly bury all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's next week. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is. There is. The conservation group, or is that what you the meeting you're referring to? Yeah. yeah. The low there, density, <laughs> lower density group. Yes. Uh, there is a, another option if your goal is just to get it out of the street. Um, or utility corridors? Well, the having alleys. alleys. Yeah. Um, and there are codes that require uh, new neighborhoods to have alleys. Um, one example of how that works um, and small new neighborhood in the city. I guess it's actually the town. This is the Bell Sherman Cottages neighborhood in the town of Ithaca. Um, Ooh, how nice that looks. No wires. It's wow. quite nice, um, except there are wires. They just run behind in the alley. Um, so it's it's all served by above ground wires that run mm -hmm. underground to the houses. Um, they just run in the back instead of in the front, which is the part of the the common historic use of alleys is that that um, is a place to put the utility easements to have the, both the underground and above ground utilities in the alley, as well as where you pick up the garbage and. Mm -hmm. Uh, where you park you your cars. Can you again, David? I'm sorry, Olivia? Can you show the alley again with the pole? Oh. It's kind of a weird site because of the stormwater. It's a big stormwater pond here, but um, there's the alley. And turn a little bit. So they only needed like two poles or something? It didn't look like a lot of poles. Oh, uh, it's hard to see. It goes back quite a ways. I don't know if I can see mm -hmm. maybe an overhead view. Yeah, I see a couple of poles there. Yeah. Um, as long as we have that picture on the screen, just to jump back to where we departed from uh, talking about roof pitches. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps, that, there. perhaps that picture would be a good example of roof pitches and what it might look like in a hamlet. Um, this is off of Mitchell, yeah. We've got a couple of places in Danby where we have the wires running behind also. Oh, that's not where I want to be. <laughs> Zoom out. Zooming too fast. There we go. So w one thing that's interesting to know about this development is that um, this developer, Toby Millman, um, he said he would never do it again um, for a combination of reasons. One being that the town of Ithaca was difficult to work with. And two being that he, these are all LEED certified modular buildings. Um, and the installation was really quick. And um, I think they did a good job and Stream Collaborative locally worked with them on it. Um, but these sold in Ithaca for I think between four and 500,000. Um, and now they're selling for more. They've gone up in value, of course. Um, like everything but, else in this tight right. market. <laughs> but he can install the exact same house in the market he more frequently works in outside of DC and charge twice as much for the same amount of work. Um, I contacted so him years ago, but he never responded because this was yeah. kind of my ideal. Yeah, uh, yeah. So basically, he just thought we didn't have a good market, and these were um, the profit margin was too thin for doing mm -hmm. these buildings. So but he does big tracts then. What's that? He does big tracts then. He's a he does 
um, a variety of scales, but it's just that he usually does them in places where they sell for much more. And as much as we talk about our housing being expensive and as much as these were expensive for the area, especially for the lot size, um, it's just not what you can get in other places. Yeah, and the cost of construction is still pretty high. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's somebody else who does something relatively similar who can do it for, or we find somebody local who can kind of mimic that. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. They are the market. That, that is the market. And that's what we're up against. Um, uh, uh, but I, I, so I, I only say that because I do think it came out really, really nice. And I, I want people to understand when they look at these, that these are half million dollar houses. Yeah. And what's the, what's the pitch on those roofs? Those are, look like they're, they're probably. Yeah, that, that, that was well, my point. Well, the, the second one in line looks well close to what David's talking about. That may be an 812. But the, one in, the one in the corner is more like, more like six. Yeah, Kelly, do you have a, a guess of that? You'd probably know better than I do. Mm. I could ask Noah, and but it, you know, I, it I is. I'd probably say close to a six. It is definitely a Greek revival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little like it's a little hard to seem skewed in the view, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, the third house is a. Oh is yeah, a, like when you <laughs> like a lot steeper when you turn it. <laughs> true that when you're looking at it straight on. Yeah. Still. Yeah, this still, I always forget that Google Earth uses a fisheye lens, so yeah, it can make things look really weird. Yeah. Um, so David, what would be the possibilities of getting some visualizations for, you know, the guidelines and maybe playing around with some of these different roof pitches so people could kind of imagine what it would look like applied to our core? Um, so I, th I think with things like roof pitches, there's so many examples of what it looks like um, that it I, d I wouldn't want to spend money having someone do that for us because if you just Google it, you'll come up with a hundred examples of tables like what I showed you guys a minute ago, mm -hmm. which is a, a built example of each pitch. Um, I do think that I want the code to be illustrated to help explain these things um, so that, uh, and that will be part of, of making the next draft of it. Yeah. Um, so the second house there on the one to the left of the one in the corner is more of a craftsman style and that has a lower pitch also. But it does have brackets because that's typical of the craftsman style. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I think my hesitation on the steep pitch is just the overall height that it adds. Mm -hmm. um, Which comes down to the uh, it might inflict some changes on the massing um, because yes. the pitch right. works well when you have a relatively skinny, which is more traditional building shape. And when you go right. into a much broader shape, um, then yeah, it will make it taller. Yeah, just like if people are gonna, you know, go for the simplest form and put a 40 by 80 box on and put their own roof on top of it at eight and 12, it's, it's a, a lot big. of roof. it is and then when they, when it got to be that side they do things like clip them um the house across the street it was like that it had a fairly steep roof but it clipped it you know it wasn't it, it didn't go all the way up to a point oh right um yes. and um yeah and then they, and then the architects nowadays are fond of adding extra fake gables to, to, to try to reduce the huge amount of area that's with on, in that triangular space which i think should be illegal if i was going to make any <laughs> style illegal that would be it yeah the, the, the gable itis <laughs> it's the worst the worst it does no it does that. break it up but <laughs> that was the purpose of my question when i asked you know how does the pitch affect the livability of it you know when you've got cases like these where the um, 
the roof is literally above the ceiling of the floor below it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The question of can, could you get living space under that roof where there's no, you know, the roof at, at the corner, the roof is has zero height. At yeah, you'd usually, the... you typically would have knee walls and you'd have some usable space in the middle, depending on how high the roof is. And also whether you, whether you insulated the roof with itself and had kind of a cathedral treatment where you could do that with foam. Yeah. Um, you you trying people, to... people still do roofs without doing uh, SIPs? Yeah. Well, you could do you could use SIPs. That would that would also accomplish the same thing. Yeah. I think that I mean, this the other is... issue with residential with the building code is that if you if that's your third floor, then you're sprinkling the building. Um, so is that, that right? adds expense. Over, over two stories, you have to sprinkle. That yeah. yeah. Um. There's I believe, also right? I. I don't do much residential. But that's my understanding. There is a. There is a way to do unsprinkled three story walk up, um, but there's a limit to how far you how far it takes to walk to the exit. Okay. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's elevator. You can do the third floor multifamily without an elevator based on the walk. Well, I know for a long time you couldn't you couldn't have occupied space in the third story. Uh, and then, and then the, the code changed at some point, and a lot of the third stories in the older buildings became usable. Again. Again. Um, on the, the question of roof form, I think this is an example of you know, going the bracket route instead. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that this, this would not comply because the brackets are so far apart, and I think it looks a little ridiculous. And if you threw in an extra bracket between each of these, I think it would look a lot nicer, mm -hmm. um, which kind of gets to what the, the requirement was. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, was that every four feet, did it? Yeah. Yeah. Those look about every 12. Oh, I don't know, it could be 10, but anyways, they're pretty far apart. Yeah. What qualifies as a bracket? I'm not following. It's a bracket, is, it, it looks like it's holding up the roof. Oh, I see. Okay. The non-functional proof there. So they're they're visually supportive, even though they might not be physically supportive. But sometimes they are physically supportive. Yeah. Um, I think the example I showed last time was what I consider kind of the the minimum the minimum quality duplex. Um, in this development here. Where did it go? The one near the roundabout. Um, is it farther down? Oh, it's just before the school. Oh, oh I know what you mean. Yeah. There it is. Yep. This one. It's kind of my minimum okayness. It's pretty boring on the sides, but it's fine on the front as far as I'm concerned. So I think it, it meets that requirement. Yeah, it's got a porch and it's got porch posts and it's got brackets. Yep. Is this a is this a pocket neighborhood or no, this is student housing in South uh -oh. on South Hill. Mm -hmm. Um but so this is the nice example. And then they put in basically the cheapest you could possibly do around the corner. I don't know if Google Earth has been updated, but people were really upset about what they did around the back. Which they kind of shoved these up against the property line. They're all the same thing. They're prefab mm -hmm. duplexes that follow the town's um, maximum number of unrelated persons rule to create student housing on this mm -hmm. map. Um, Does Ithaca work. College need so much more student housing? Yeah, I think so. And there's a, a, a major new initiative happening on South Hill, I mean, literally taking out the whole hill. And doing something there. Oh yeah, that, uh, that apartment building. What is yeah. it going to be? 
Uh, it's right by the the cell tower there. Yeah, right. Okay. I mean that's major excavation. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Given more housing, they'll get more students. And heck, having more students, they need more housing. Yeah, but don't, aren't they facing a situation where they've had de declining enrollment rather than increasing? Mm -hmm. uh, that is correct. That is That does not follow. There has been declining enrollment. And part of it has come from the fact that there's a declining uh, student population period in the country. Yes. Yeah. But there's certainly still a shortage of housing for them. They compete with other people in Ithaca. It's part of what makes it so expensive to live in the city. This is where that other apartment is going. Mm -hmm. Oh, where this empty lot is, empty space is now. Yep. Sort of. Terrible for traffic. It'll be better for traffic in the long run. Those people will be able to walk to school. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> anyway, that's a, a little off topic if we want to get back to, oh, we're pretty much out of time, but the, the, the text, we started talking about the landscaping requirements. Um, I, I'm yeah, not I still sure wonder about the, the roof. The roof so, yeah, so if we if we if we include the street tree requirement, we're basically punting on solar. I don't think that. So I live in the city. There's lots of street trees and there's lots of buildings with solar. Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think it's possible that in some cases, some street trees could make some solar installations difficult. But I think that having the impact that they make on the street is more important than making it. Making that requirement it have a, to, does it have a spacing requirement right now typed in there? It does. It, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have to be, they could be closer than, but they have to be one every, every so often. There's a, there's a minimum distance, right? Between. Let's see, one front yard tree for every 30 feet of road frontage. Right, and this is where I raised the concern because they're along 96B. Um, we're talking about new, we're talking about new developments though, keep in mind. Right, but if one were to put houses along, or buildings, uh, commercial buildings along 96B, you already have a problem with the lines there. I mean, part of the, the trees, you know, are V-shaped on my property because of the yeah. line. Right. Didn't didn't it doesn't make a lot of sense then to No, didn't didn't David say it was an exception for the for in the event that the wires are in the way? Yes, mm -hmm. that's correct. So if you did trees there, then we'd want something that's short enough that it wouldn't grow up in the wires. Right. Right. And that the it, that's a north south um axis in terms of solar anyway. Right, it's true. So they wouldn't be in the way there. Although they might provide some afternoon shade where you might otherwise have sun. Oh, right. but, yeah, the rest of the sun. Yeah. But certainly not if they were short. But if you planted the same sort of thing that they planted across the street when they took down the trees, which is what they got along the uh, next to the town hall on both sides, there, those are, those are uh, um, honey locusts, mm -hmm. and they're pretty good. They're pretty big trees. I mean, they grow to the 50 feet. They're pretty much at their mature height now. Mm -hmm. But those are plenty big enough to shade the solar array if they were in front of it, mm -hmm. in front of a house that was south-facing, with mm -hmm. a south-facing roof. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I asked was like, if you had like a, I don't know. I guess the way that's written. It, you could kind of interpret it either way. Like if you had 90 feet of frontage and you're, you needed like half of that, not without a tall tree so that you could get your direct sunlight, then you put all three trees within the other, within the, like within 45 of that 90 feet mm -hmm. so that they're shading the side that's not the portion of your building that doesn't have the, the, uh, Solar arrays on. Not, it, it, not in the primary yeah. solar gain part of the day. Right. Yeah. And 
trees do a lot to improve the energy efficiency of a building if they do shade it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we want to you want to you want them to shade it in the afternoon. Especially the west sun. From the west. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kelly reading that that wording made me think of a question. If it was 89 feet, is it is the text written in such a way that you'd still need three or would it drop to two instantly? Um, it would drop to two. Is that is that just posing the question? Is that what intended or should it be for every 30 feet or portion thereof? I think it's reasonable. To, I mean, what we're trying to do is get some trees all mm -hmm. along the street. And the exact number is really not going to make or break one way or another. Um, 30 foot feet is a relatively, so some codes tell you what to space the trees. You know, you have mm -hmm. to have a tree every 40 feet, every 50 feet. Um, by not doing that and creating some flexibility by requiring a slightly lower number means more trees, um, but with more flexibility of how you, how and yeah. where they get planted. For a lot of trees, 30 feet is very tight spacing. I mean, I plant, uh, you know, the full size apple trees should be 40 feet apart. You know, that's anything bigger than, you know, sugar maples, Elms, lots of things we want to do. Most properties along 96B in the core are really, really close to the road. And yeah. Um, I already had to take down uh, three trees in front of 1849, big pines, unfortunately, and another big tree just because they were aging out and they were so close to the house that yeah. they worry about them falling on the house. And it was incredibly expensive to take down those trees. It was devastating too because you know one of them was still a perfectly viable tree, but it was so close to the house. Which is... mm -hmm. David, can you uh, how far apart are the are the uh, honey locusts to the left of you in the picture on on the on the south side of the town hall? Mm. Out comes Google Earth. So I can tell you that the honey locusts I have in front of 1839, the, the branches are extending practically into the second floor windows. Yeah, right. But how far apart are those trees? Because that's a, you know, that that with that spacing one taken down. I already had another yeah, that, that spacing isn't too bad. Uh. And then there's the issue of all the leaves in the gutters and the gutters getting clogged up. And... Yeah. But, I mean, if you want them to shade the house, you don't want, they, they can't be too far away or they, they, they don't effectively shade it either. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge to balance it. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a town where the, where the, uh, where the older streets, at least the main street, were, were lined with American elms that were 120 feet tall. How and far away were they from the houses though? They were not that far, maybe 20 feet. And with a DBH of, you know, four to six feet. Uh, and they towered over these three story colonials. But there was no way you would have done any solar. You know, they were totally, um, they were totally uh, shaded areas. And of course, people appreciated the shade. I mean, you, the, the, they were closed canopy across the main street. Mm -hmm. Which is. Uh, so I would they, say they, more important when you can buy into solar offsite. Yes, right. Yeah. So it's hard to tell exactly where the trunks are because of the 3D modeling that Google Earth does. But I think the trees that you were talking about are about 50 feet apart. Yeah, yeah. And that's a reasonable spacing for a full size tree like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately full size. But you can see on the on the other side of the town hall, the 1839 Dandy Road, the, pro the property there. I mean, how how close the trees are to the road and to the house, mm -hmm. and the wires going along there. Yep. Yeah, the wires are on that side of the street. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's really quite a... Yeah, that's not an unreasonable... Well, you've got a pretty good branch on, in that direction of the house there. That <laughs> you might no, no one is saying that you have to plant trees that will get this big either. Although no, no, um, and those are those are pretty nice trees. They're pretty strong trees. You know, it's not mm -hmm. it's not a huge risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the advantage is that they leaf out so late in the springtime, so you have mostly a lot of good um, sun coming in for most of it. Yeah, the and they're they're a fairly light shade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're that was in the right place for you because it's blocking the west sun. If we, if you want to look back at that neighborhood we were looking at a minute ago, um, what they did to include, oh, I don't think the imagery is there. I was going to say what they did to include street trees um, was putting it in the parking aisle. Uh, but I think the image is out of date. Yeah. There Which it is. One? The cottages or the is it a college? The cottages. Oh, you can see here where they put where the tree wells are. Um, they put them in the parking aisle, breaking up the parking um, uh -huh. because the the site was too tight um, to have a tree lawn, and it worked so out really. They did bump outs basically. Yeah, it worked out really well. You've got a tree lawn on one side and the. Uh, yes, the tree, tree uh, islands or peninsulas. Yeah. It helps the, helps the street not feel too wide, even though it's a little wider than they wanted it to be. Yeah, it, it, yeah right, it makes it feel smaller. Yeah, that um, experience that I have in an older development in Reston, those tree aisles there, the trees do not have the longevity that they should because their their roots are under they're under pavement unless you have a permeable um, paving surface. In the long run, they don't live. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, of course, you know, Cornell developed their structural soil for trees, which can help. It's good. And structural soil, people act like it's something um, amazing or complicated, but it's just having some rocks in the dirt. Yeah, right. So, that it, that it, so that there's some place for the roots to go without being completely compacted dirt. Yeah. Google Earth crashes my computer. Um, and I was going to mm -hmm. zoom in on my neighborhood and measure the spacing. Um, Between street trees? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, in my neighborhood, they're between 20 and 40 feet. I can show you what that looks like. With any kind of planting like that, we're looking at trees that are going to be really big in the long run. There's always the what it looks like when you plant them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, it, it, it can it, it it it's typical to sort of overplant the landscape because for immediate impact, but then as it grows out, it ends up looking kind of crowded. Well, I, I do think that when we're starting with new trees, it makes sense to have them closer, and then as they get bigger, you can take some out, um, just like you would with with seedlings in a garden where you. Can you can do that, one. although it's a little um, bit painful to do if it's a, if it's a, if it's a nice tree. But yeah. Yeah. Um, now, this is an interesting example that you've got here where they, they could have put tall trees on one side of the street and they put short trees because there's no wires. And then on the side with wires, they put tall trees that are growing up in the wires. Uh, I think it's more a temporal thing that these are newer trees um, and the larger ones are older. They, they replace a a few a year, like we've got, we lost one right here, mm -hmm. and they cut one down right here, then cut one down farther down the block. Um, and having enough that you can do that without destroying, without making it a barren street is really nice. Right, and, uh, unlike what happened when the elms all went and the street was lined with elms. 
Exactly. <laughs> Jake up ginkgos on your street. We do. We have a we have a broad mix. We have a lot of different colors and um, some flowering. So it's it's good to have that mix. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a new development when they had new trees. These are much bigger now. Um, but you know, I want I want to think about what they are going to look like when they're new. We don't have a neighborhood that looks like crap for twenty years. Well, we're waiting for the trees to grow. Right? Until the trees grow in, yeah. yeah, which is really common. And that's why there's requirements for um, for the diameter, for them to be fairly substantial trees and not little toothpicks like this. Um, yeah, of course, a lot of that, some of that depends on species, you know, how fast they grow. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So. I mean, the elm on my, on my west lawn is, is now over 40 feet tall and it's not much, it's, I don't think it's 15 years old yet. Mm -hmm. Because it put, because it puts on, it put on four feet a year in the first few years. Yeah. So where are we at here? I'm hearing some concern about requiring trees. When I wrote this stuff, we had heard a lot of concern about if we're going to allow development, we need to have really good street trees and make sure that it's green and comfortable. And yeah, well, I'm, I've I've circled back around from my concern about solar to coming around to seeing it more your way, David, about the uh, you know, community solar being a good solution for for those who have um, that um, you know desire to plug into solar. Yeah. Whereas the you know the shade and and what the trees offer in terms of the the you know sort of a sheltered and and, and environment um, is is a pretty important contribution to the character of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and it's durable and you know it creates resiliency. It's not technology dependent. I think we're just being again you encourage it, but I mean or require it, but leave it open so that if, if it's if it's just not realistic or feasible based on the lot conditions that you know that you're flexible about it so we have the flexibility of the Very flexibility neat. that's in there right now is this um, planting is exempt when existing above or below grade utilities prevent planting of street trees, or if the existing design of the street will not accommodate street tree planting. Yeah, that's probably pretty comprehensive. That deals with existing streets. And if you're planning, if you're doing new streets, then you can avoid those constraints by, pl by planning accordingly. Mm -hmm. We haven't addressed, and are we going to, the uh, street specs? No. Mm -hmm. Is that no, we're not going to, or no, no we haven't addressed it? <laughs> or I both. think it's both. We're definitely not going to address it tonight. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Did, did you reach a conclusion, yeah. a conclusion about the um, roof pitch? I don't think we did. I'm, I appreciate Kelly's recommendation of a 612. Um, I, not sure I heard any for or against that proposition. I would I'd, I would be willing to support that. Do others have comments on if they would be comfortable with going to 612 instead of 812? And it doesn't preclude lower slopes as long as they're in conjunction with bracketed cornices. Yep, you always have that option. I don't hear any any support or lack or opposition. Ted, do you have an opinion? Yes, but it doesn't help the matter. I don't see how making these decisions um, uh, relates to the rural character of the town. We're talking about the hamlet. Uh, it's still part of the town. The hamlet is part of the town. Yeah. So I mean, it relates being... more to the Hamlet character of the town. 
Well, I found those, what David called the Bell Sherman houses, which were Maple Avenue houses before <laughs> Maple Avenue was obliterated. Um, I, I found them ugly and uh, totally outrageously expensive. They had no garages. The, the houses were jammed in together. And if you're gonna live that close to your neighbors, you might as well be in an apartment building. Um, I, Rhonda, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut you off, Rhonda, because people feel differently than you. We know you don't wanna live next to people and that's why you don't, but a lot of people do, which is why they paid a lot of money to live there. But the um, thing is that in the hamlet, the thing it's going to prevent by doing this is having, I mean, it probably won't, it wouldn't be to the same scale, but that a new apartment building that's on Cherry Street, that's literally a box with windows in it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not implying that we should have apartment buildings, though some people have. All I'm saying is that the houses that are there in the hamlet now have significant space between the houses and garages and space for garages and have plenty of trees and shrubs and things like that that help shade the houses and give a certain amount of privacy and quiet to their property. And I think that when you start opening up certain areas, then you take away from the people who are already there. Well, we're not talking about replacing the houses that are there. No, but I'm saying, you know, if you start jamming <laughs> a little, you know, these houses into very small spaces, then uh, it's um, for the other people who are already there and, whoops, and have, um, ha have this space and privacy that they've cultivated, that living in the hamlet isn't going to be so appealing for them. Well, I know that the, the, market, the market will determine that. No, Ron is yeah. right. I mean, that's a lot of controversy about uh, the infill in the downtown area where you know people are taking out trees that have provided um, you know sort of ecosystems and shelter and shade and all kinds of other benefits to neighbors and now they're being taken out and buildings are being put up in backyards and so now people are looking out of their house into a building rather than a tree and I don't know how to solve that you know I you know the, that issue I mean it's I guess we're saying that on the, the in the Hamlet core in the Hamlet neighborhood there will be a move towards greater density and only then people ultimately who want to live in those environments will move there but yeah. um, David, back to the, I mean, to the slope, I mean, maybe do we need to make it so restrictive? Can we say maybe just something that, that needs to be in a style that's vernacular to, you know, the, the Hamlet's history, something that is consistent with architecture between 1850 and 1910 or something like that, so that we don't actually dictate slope of roofs but just provide maybe a, a parameter and it's then it's ambiguous yeah and we have some, we have some pretty plain jane houses from that from that period olivia if you look around town but if you do something vague like that it goes to the planning board and they can't they can't make any decisions you have to give them specific metrics well, we certainly could do that that's what the Hand, That's what the, the commercial, commercial design, design guidelines line. do. Yeah. I didn't do that because I don't personally like regulating style and prefer to regulate parameters instead of style. I do like those styles. They're nice. Um, but I, I found that telling people what style their house should be and not usually be a good way to start a conversation. Um, that's why we went with uh, measurement instead not that, of... Yeah, not that it has to be a specific style, but that it incorporates aspects of, you know, these different styles from Greek revival up through, yeah. 
I think if you if you go that broad that it doesn't actually have to be the style, um, then you might as well just say nothing. It could be anything. I agree because I mean if you, if you say well if I'm from the Greek revival period I'm going to pull a four twelve roof, you know, um, and from the uh, from the you know from from the many examples of plain farmhouses around the around the uh, around the area I'm, I'm going to have a I'm going to have a closed cornice but no ornamentation whatsoever. Um, and you can end up with a box. You know, I mean, it, you could you could justify a double wide on that on 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 that but using those that set of criteria. And so it, it pulls from you know, the Greek Revival period. Mm -hmm. Actually, not, point. not anything I'd want a whole lot of. So I mean, you know, the rose beautiful little American Gothic burned down. If they, you know, if these guidelines were in place, would they have been? I mean, they basically put in a double wide. Would they have been required to conform to these guidelines? Well, the roof would have been steeper. Mm. Or it would have had brackets. Or it would have had brackets, right. Mm. I think it, you know, that house with a steeper roof would look better than what's there now. But are then there are cost considerations that we're imposing on people? No yeah. doubt. The steeper roof is more expensive. That's why double wide manufactured homes have 312 pitches and modulars have steeper ones. I mean, because we have had that issue with a couple of houses in the hamlet that have burned down and, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're gonna get much farther than Kelly's made a suggestion. I've heard two, two people say they're okay with it. I think I haven't heard anybody say they're not okay with it. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. abstention. A firm abstention. A firm abstention, right. We could, we could fly it up. We could put the 612 in and see what, if we get a, you know, if we get a huge uh, public outcry that this is ridiculous, then we can always back away from it. Uh, someone... alterna alternatively, if we get people saying, you know, um, you know, if you have a spec like that, then all well, we're going to get is humdrum boxes. Um, if someone wanted something else, they could always go to the BZA, right? They could. Is it BZA yeah, you would go to? Probably because you're looking at a variance from the specs. Yeah. Actually, uh, two cents about what Rhonda said earlier. I mean, I, I don't happen to you know, I, I think the, the houses in the pictures you were showing are boring. I don't know, I'd, I'd say ugly. But when you talk about the spacing of between them and the overall look, I think we've, the discussion in earlier meetings pretty much seemed to go in the direction that that's what we want. Right. We decided on that spacing. Now we're talking just about how they look or they might, you know, or architectural details. Uh, we, we've that ship has already sailed. We're, we're just deciding on which details we like the most. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. what was the other option before six twelve? Eight twelve. Eight. Steeper. Yeah, Steeper. I'm looking at I'm looking at some pitches here. I could go with the six twelve. I, I think I'm. I think the pitch needs to be steeper too. I don't. I think six twelve is not very, pretty close to flat looking. It's probably, it's probably as low as you want to go if you want something that has that looks like it's steep. Uh -huh. But I mean, look at the garage with the five twelve in the upper right. It doesn't look that bad. It actually looks steeper than the six twelve picture. Yes, yeah, because the six twelve got the you know gable under gable. And they both look pretty flat to me, but that's why I said eight. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like we have some reasonable consensus around putting in six for this draft. And we can uh, address it again later if we really yeah. want to. Um, I don't think the pitch on 1849 is probably, well, maybe it's more like seven. What do you think, David? Seven or eight on that eight? Is it a Greek revival? Mm 
you know, they tend to be relatively flat, but it, they have nice they details. Do. You know, they that's, tend, yeah, they're nicely detailed. Well, the typical temple front, a temple front would look at, would be, you know, in the, somewhere in the range of four to six. Yeah, and definitely the, the, the buildings that the Johansons put on at the back are definitely. Yeah. Also. Well, I mean, look at the look at the town hall. If you, if 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 David move his head aside a little bit, um, that's a that's a that's an entablature in the front there, with basically a temple front with a with a with a you know hat on it. Um, that roof was what maybe a seven. Yeah, I'm guessing mine is probably about a seven. Mm -hmm. That look right to you, Kelly? Yeah, I'd say around, I, I would say it's not an eight. No, it's not an eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd say somewhere probably around seven-ish. Do we have to have one thing? We can't say six. <laughs> Six and a half. <laughs> We're just, I, I mean, it Olivia, doesn't have to be a number, but it's easier to build, and it's a minimum. Like they can do anything above it. Or, well, I know it's easy to build. Flat it's, with the other option. Yeah, I built the house uh, my, uh, across the street. I built a, 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 a "quote unquote" shed for my neighbor, and I made it twelve twelve. That's really easy to build because you're looking at forty five degree angles then, not even forty five. Especially for accessory buildings. I mean. Yeah. But on the other hand, my, my the main roof of my house is more like a fourteen twelve, because it's Victorian. Mm -hmm. right. But the garage that butts against it is is about a five twelve. Yeah. Well, I'm fine with the six twelve as a minimum. Yeah, okay. and that's for the principal dwelling, right? That's not for the accessories. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that that is where we should wrap up for the night. Um, we're way over time. Um, yeah, we're having such an interesting discussion, though. Glad you think so. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for being here again. Um, I'll be taking a draft to the town board this month um, and we'll have a chance for people to give feedback over the next month following that um, and see where we go from there moving forward. OK. Is so that happening at the, um, the meeting uh, on the nineteenth? No, oh, it's going to be on. It'll be on the nineteenth. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good weekend. Bye. Yeah.